Welcome to AI Talks, a place to come and listen to IBM customers, partners, and colleagues talk about the digital organization and how AI, hybrid cloud, and enterprise software is critical to success. Let me hand over to my colleagues to get us started. Welcome to AI Talks podcast. It's great to be joined today by our business partner, Synthesis, with Mark Williamson. Hi, Mark. Good morning, Paul. Nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to you as well. And our special guest, Vijay Patil from the HS2 organization. And really what we're hoping to talk today about with Vijay is really how such a complex project like HS2 is really taking advantage of the importance of engineering quality lifecycle management and what that really means. So Vijay, welcome to AI Talks podcast. It's great to be here, Paul. Thank you. And VJ, for kicking off, just tell us a little bit about, you know, your formal job title. What does that cover in terms of areas of responsibility? So I work as a part of the systems integration team and I'm supporting the digital engineering work stream, particularly for the requirements. Um, so I'm working as a DOS database administrator manager with HS2, supporting the integration work stream from requirements viewpoint, facilitating the delivery of the project, you know, through that integration work stream is what our core mandate is. I wanted to frame again something that I read in a book called The Clock of the Long Now, which is written by a guy called Stuart Brand way back before the turn of the century, in fact. Uh, and he used this phrase, which when I thought about the podcast with you today, VJ, I thought really summed it up. And, and the phrase was, the fast gets all the attention, but it's the slow has all the control. You know, HS2 is getting all the attention. But then when I think about behind the scenes in the integration, that probably has to be where the control is. And I just thought, do you agree with that statement? That, that quote does put a smile on my face. As an engineer. <laughs> you know, this is how we feel really, you know, for HS2, I think uh, the fast moving parts are what it is in the public eye, you know, the economic progress that is bringing out an example of economically sustainable, economically advanced, uh, ecologically sustainable project that it is and the engineering behind it is perhaps the slow part you know the integration the painstaking detailed design that's all slow part and I am actually involved in the slow part so we have the responsibility to engineer this project right to integrate this project right and to deliver uh, the operating railway in the right way so yes I think that's a very apt quote for what we are trying to do here at uh, HS2. In terms of integration, the fast part of your business, the business that's promoting HS2, you know, no doubt working with industry partners to you know, develop the, the story and the, the, the business case. What is, what is the relationship like in terms of the slow part, the fast and slow parts? Is that, is that something that's tightly integrated? If you look on the face of it, really, HS2 is a rather complex project. You know, it has a very public, publicly governed and legislative framework. Uh, baseline to which work we work to and then there is a rather complex engineering organization rather complex engineering and delivery workflow uh, but thankfully I think in my perspective you know, from my view um, the HS2 management has seen this from day one so we have got a very very strong leadership uh, you know very strong leadership values a really driven culture really that we are all committed to delivering this railway railway for future of Britain so in that sense bridging the both ends you know the fast moving part and really bringing that slow moving part to meet up the demands of that fast moving part is something that I think the leadership team, the engineering leadership team at HS2 has done particularly well. I joined HS2 uh, a few months back and I must say really for a complex project uh, with such a strong governance focus, uh, we are really moving at a pretty fast pace in terms of development, in terms of integration. And I think a lot of credit in that sense really goes back to the leadership rather than Mark, you know, to every other engineers uh, that we have in our team. Vijay, I think you make a very good point about complexity there. And I came across a really interesting article a week or so ago from, from the real minister, Chris Heaton Harris. They were really discussing some of the lessons learned from another major public uh, rail infrastructure project where Crossrail had obviously has had issues, as, as we know. Notwithstanding, the Crossrail project has been hugely challenging and, and incredibly complex to build that network underneath an existing city, underneath existing infrastructure. But some of the issues that came around was that complexity does kill, you know. So how do we, how do we mitigate that complexity with the use of 
engineering principles and, and, and te current technology and applications and tools. Is that something that you, you see happening in HS2 already or something you'd like to see happening in HS2? So this is something um, very close to my heart. In fact, the reasons that my role actually exists is really to facilitate that. Complexity, you know, if you want to deliver something huge, uh, which is something really big, complexity is an inherent part of that task. Um, and what we need to do, what we try to do as engineers, is reduce that complexity and replace it with clarity. Um, and really, this is where the engineering best practices come into the play, uh, the governance come into the play, the communication come into the play, the collaborative uh, work comes into the play, and obviously, probably most importantly, the tools that we use for this trade, they come into the play. So, for example, we are working uh, in digital engineering on several ways of looking at information, uh, several ways of integrating that information with each other. Um, I use a tool, IBM tool called DOS, uh, which synthesis you guys have supported us really over the months. And it's working incredibly well, really, you know, for us to sort of bridge the contractors, the engineers, the approvers, and the management team as well, in terms of building the technical content, building the technical confidence, and really making all this progress visible. So yes, the complexity is essential part of what we do. But if we have better governance, if we have better tools, if we have better means of collaborating and communicating, we can really tame this beast and uh, make it, to be honest, our, our friend really use it for our advantage. Yeah, obviously, VJ, you know, doors is, you know, a, a key tool for requirements management element. But I think in the HS2 scheme, it's, it's taking it to another level, really, because you're reaching out to maybe contractors that haven't traditionally used that system engineering methodology and trying to tie that into assurances, for example, is, is that must be more of a challenge than just the, the typical system engineering you know, requirements, derivation process. Yes, Mark. I mean, you mentioned systems engineering, and it's such an integral part of what we do here in the systems integration team, really, because this methodology allows us to manage the complexity. So essentially, I mean, what I relate to is the systems engineering viewpoint. So assurance is a viewpoint of systems engineering. Requirement is a viewpoint of a systems engineering. Contract management and delivery is another viewpoint of the systems engineering. So essentially, when people are actually working in these domains, you know, specific domains for requirements or assurance, I think what we need to understand is the interfaces between these viewpoints, you know, how the information is actually related between these two work streams. Um, and then essentially, with that minimal awareness, if both teams function according to certain set rules and guidances within systems engineering, it is very likely that we will deliver the required capability, required functionality, required performance of that system. And uh, this whole principle really is, is what we do in, in systems uh, integration and systems engineering at HS2. Looking at the different viewpoints and sort of managing the speciality within that domain and then allowing the interfaces to sort of work with each other rather than against each other is something uh, that we try to do at HS2. And then again, you know, sort of this allows us then manage the complexity that report, by the way, is very eye-opening, really. Out of those five points, Mark, that you mentioned, mm. three of them are, I think, quite directly related. You know, complexity uh, is there, systems integration is there, and assurance, progressive assurance is there. I think all three sort of these key things fall within the limit of systems integration and systems engineering. And that tells us, I think, you know, this is the, the new age where we can see the direct relevance between systems engineering as a as a discipline, the systems engineering tools and methods, the systems engineering processes, and how they are directly relevant to these large infrastructure projects. Brilliant, VJ. I mean, as a system engineering practitioner for more years than I care to mention, I, uh, I just see these problems keep coming back. There is often no recognition of actually what system engineering is, to be sure, as well. You never mind uh, how to actually implement it. At risk of diving down another rabbit hole, I mean, from your perspective, because there's such a, a cross-section of uh, civil infrastructure, stations, uh, track signaling, all the rest of it, is there a consideration of you know, the enterprise architecture, you know, using one of those, another one of the system engineering terms, you know, the, our architectural modeling of, of how the system should work within a system of systems, if you like, as well? Is that a step too far at this point, BJ? 
Well, not really, to be honest. I think that's, again, a part of core methodology. In fact, the way we read for HS2 as a HS2 system, and the way we have defined the HS2 system in our systems engineering management plan is it being a system of systems. So we actually recognize the complexity of such a system, really. Uh, we actually recognize the complexity, the emergent behaviors, you know, coming out of a system of system realm. We are trying to basically put in place all the governance required, all the methods and tools required to manage uh, such a thing. Now, you mentioned enterprise architecture, and uh, yes, this is actually very directly related to the digital engineering work stream as well. So essentially, we see HS2 as a sort of a three-part program, one which looks at the procurement, one which looks at uh, the integration of the procurement systems, and then the operation of the system, the operational railway. And the transitions between sort of procure to integrate, from integrate to operate, um, is where the enterprise architecture uh, domain kind of sort of comes into play. So which systems we use for procurement and how these systems sort of lead on to the other systems, operational systems that we use during integration and how these integrated systems then move further into operation. All the necessary work that we have to do, you know, the technical work that we have to do, the assurance work that we have to do from uh, one phase to other is really a part of the integration workflow, the integration work stream that we are developing. The interchangeable use of the word complex and complicated, I think you've you, you touched on complexity um, and, and Mark as well a, a number of times and, and you know, I'm no doubt complexity points throughout the life cycle of something like HS2 but differentiate between what is complicated you know with root cause analysis we can move through a complicated problem solving solution delivery program versus complex where multiple stakeholders maybe different com competing agendas creating therefore uncertain outcomes you know unintended consequences even. I imagine your world is full of all of these. The software can control complicated, but complex are going to come at you from totally other areas. I mean, the analogy for me is the National Health Service. And I think this is a every engineer's dilemma, really. It's quite important to think of this particular point as well, because I think the solution process then becomes different. For example, you know, in my view, uh, a complex problem needs a bit more sort of governance, procedural approach. It also needs some intellect, you know, to solve it. You need the people with the right experience and right understanding of the domain, you know, that's how complex problems can be solved. If it's a complicated problem, then what we need is more or less uh, an open and clear communication, more planning, more governance, and that sort of thing. Complex problems, I think, give a more radical solution. Complicated problems, perhaps, can be solved, you know, with simple communication and a bit more of a governance. And for HS2, I think it's a mix of both, really. You know, it, the domain that we work in, if you look at the operational uh, logistics of this, you know, the number of people who get involved, the number of people who get replaced, uh, amount of concrete, basically, that we work with, is mind-bogglingly high uh, proportion. And to manage all of that, you know, as one system uh, is, I think, complicated and complex at the same time. And I think added to that, actually, VJ, you have the, the socio-technological issues as well. You know, you've got the social aspect of how people can work together and how different organisations within that whole HS2 conglomerate can work together. You know, the, the enabling partners and the supporting partners, you know, uh, never mind the technical aspects of how to get that, you know, how, how to get that engineering done, you know, in a, in a, in a collaborative way. Yeah, it's amazing you mentioned this, Mark. We had an innovation week in HS2. The, this is again another sort of cultural shift in how a company, which is almost a public company, you know, operates. So that innovation week was open to anybody and everybody who wanted to participate in the HS2 innovation process. So it was open to the HS2 employees, um, HS2 supply chain, the entire supply chain. I was told that it was attended by about 1,200 people, so the whole week. And we had specific challenges around these areas in particular, you know, how do we manage information, how do we sort of assure the validity of that information better? How do we sort of manage the carbon footprint of this particular project? Everything was within the scope. And we came across some uh, very interesting ideas and some very interesting trends. And there was obviously a discussion around, you know, what we see in terms of ideas. And I think there were a few key trends which we had identified. And one of them was definitely the socioeconomic effects. Basically the perception of people towards engineering is changing. We don't want a high-performing railway, just high-performing railway. We want a high-performing railway that is uh, economic, that is ecologically sustainable, 
that's green almost, you know, that allows us to do better things. And this is a change in perception, you know, not just performance, not just a diesel vehicle that goes fast, uh, costs less to maintain. We want a railway that is suitable for ecological future. And that's the change in the perception. I think in terms of uh, economic options as well, you know, how these projects are financed is actually a very interesting domain. I wouldn't venture in there, but I think there is a fair bit of scope in terms of innovating really how these projects are below delivered. So the social socioeconomic effects. Um, we also looked at the emerging technologies, so how, for example, manufacturing assembly processes are changing. There is increasing use of automation technologies such as 3D printing, uh, which are being a part of, of the um, emerging uh, engineering landscape. And uh, that's, that's something which is driving um, the, the innovation in waste sector as well. There is another factor that we looked at, which was the startup culture. So essentially, this is a openness towards high risk ideas that provide high gain. And this is a really different thing, you know, in terms of uh, uh, classical businesses, classical engineering businesses, like what we have in railways. This is something I think that we have learned from the software industry, which has shown that there is a merit in investing seemingly complex and out of the world ideas, but that will come to fruition at some point in future and become extremely relevant. Um, and that, that is one of the innovation factors that drives our work here at HSP. In terms of development methods and how we do, the traditional focus is towards linear engineering uh, workflow wherein we start with a, a design and then we come to fulfillment and then we check whether everything is made to the plan and we accept it. However, that linear workflow is now replaced with the integrative development methods. Uh, so essentially what we take, take away from systems engineering really the recycle development. Um, and that alone is actually offering ample opportunities to innovate in you know, how we engineer uh, these things. There is also a prolific spread of collaborative and AI tools. And I'm sure IBM um, and you, uh, Mark, are well familiar with the developments in these tools and they offer an opportunity to innovate for us. It's not just the innovation in terms of what the actual product is, but I think innovating in terms of how we deliver that product. And uh, at HS2, we are looking at both, you know, how we sort of use these things. In terms of other uh, couple, of, couple of things that we touched base on, one was actually a highly scalable infrastructure. So how the IT systems can now be knocked up really, uh, developed with a very little uh, burden and then scaled up almost instantly. And that allows us to sort of uh, think about how we can use this particular capability uh, to innovate at HS2. So there were these several factors, I think, and the common theme was really moving forward uh, in a world which is changing, uh, which is basically being driven by these innovation forces and how the rail industry in general, how the HS2 as, a, as an entity can actually accept and adopt these changes and innovate, you know, innovate, to reduce the cost, improve the reliability, improve the sustainability of this particular project. And it was a very interesting, very, very interesting experience for, uh, for me and perhaps everybody who was involved. Uh, well, that, well, that's music to my ears, Vijay. I mean, going back to, you know, the, uh, uh, my expertise around requirements management and my whole ethos is to left shift that risk, left shift that requirements definition as, as early as possible. So you're not doing that, you know, end case testing and, and having to do lots of rework. And the other thing you mentioned, BJ, was about the IT infrastructure. I think we've all seen examples of IT, uh, major IT projects uh, historically that have been a, a major overhead to the project rather than enabler. You know, so we obviously, we want to help you out and provide those applications and tools to enable you to do the job without getting in the way, if you like. Absolutely. I, I was talking to someone the other day about the Brandenburg, the Berlin Brandenburg Airport, which if, if, you, if neither of you have ever mm. looked into, it's an amazing example of requirements definition. But it, but it struck me again, going back to that project and also your world at HS2, is about how can you make the slower almost, and I think you're saying this, VJ, with some of the comments around startups and, and using that kind of mindset, how can you make the slower, not, not go fast, but, you know, almost, you know, catch up slightly. And I don't, and I don't mean that like it's behind the, like behind the curve, but almost embed it in, in the overall solution. Because too often, I think, especially from an IT point of view, the work there has never fully been grasped by the overall 
solution. And therefore, you know, we have had problems with delays and certainly in the built world, we've seen multiple delays of, of Project Wembley Stadium because of that lack of a cohesive embedding of, of IT. Um, and I suppose wrapping IT around all of the components is part and parcel of your job. Indeed, and digital engineering is really sort of looking at that particular area. You know, the name says it all really. We're trying to digitalize engineering as much as we can. And we're using it basically at the moment for requirements management. We're using it for system architecture definition, enterprise architecture. We're using it for config control and really merging these different threads, different tools together into one uh, cohesive engineering landscape. You know, that then allows us to sort of maintain the capability, maintain the reliability of the system longer term. I'm really glad you mentioned configuration control, VJ, because if there's one thing that's going to derail, for whatever better term, a project, it's bad configuration control, you know, having different versions of documents and requirements and standards all, all mixed up. I mean, I just, uh, I've been told that we have like 10 million plus assets. Wow. Um, which we need to individually configure and control, understand which parts uh, they belong to, you know, which baseline they belong to. And it's an amazing feat, you know, it's an amazing feat, really. Just the scale of it, you know, blowing it up to such a scale does present a very significant integration challenge. And we have to be absolutely innovative, cutting edge, you know, to embrace that challenge. And I think this is where the leadership is steering us. Smart Thurston, for example, is absolutely, absolutely keen for us to take that risk and innovate and act in time rather than working on the assumptions. I think there is a very strong push from the leadership to challenge the prevalent way of doing things, the mindsets, even looking at how soon we need to procure something. You know, we discussed this, when we need to write the specifications, how soon they need to go out. You know, traditionally certain things come very last in the railway project development life cycle. We are pushing doing that really earlier. And perhaps that gives us some benefits in terms of, you know, things that usually be used as a part of infrastructure. I think if you procure and build them early enough, we can use them for integration testing. Very rewarding to be part of that culture. Your comments about 10 million assets, whether you've, you've ever... Yes, it's never been heard of really. This is yeah. the first time really that we have come across. Because I think uh, the way the procurement chain works is pretty granular. And okay. essentially, even though, for example, every uh, contractor supplier would see only a few hundred assets, we have so many of them, you know, literally so many of them, and they have subcontractors. In terms of config, configuration control, I think all the artifacts associated with these assets, so let it be a concrete column, a, a roof, a slab, you know, everything is really an asset. And then there is a whole suite of information artifacts associated with these assets, which gets checked, controlled. And that's why I think the, the, the collective tree of the configuration uh, management system is very huge. So Vijay, listen, thank you so much. Great points that you're making, which I'm sure really do talk to that phrase I shared at the start about the fast gets all the attention, but definitely in the case of HS2, it is the engineering discipline um, that, that has the control and, and the work that you guys are doing in, in the integration teams. But I just wanted to ask you more of a personal question really, as an engineer, what does all this mean to you and what does it make you feel and think about your job and, and also what the, the result will be when it's successful? I think it's a, it's a great question really, Paul. You know, thanks very much for that because I think it, it allows me to speak as an engineer. And I must say really, we all know the controversy around the HS2. You know, we all know the good and bad points around HS2 and everything that goes in the press about HS2. I think what we need to realize is as an engineering team, you know, as an engineer, we stand in the middle of this with, with one goal, really, that is to deliver this railway to the best of our abilities. Um, and really, this is, this is a monumental challenge, I think, you know, to, to come up to the work and ignore all the controversy around it, ignore all the discussions, ignore all the challenges and get on with it. It, it, need, it needs a certain mindset, I think. And for us, really, the leadership team is really helping and supporting us to do it. For us, I think there is a level of integrity that we bring in every day to the, to the work. Um, and obviously, the experience, the varied experience that we bring in as a team to work. And that's allowing us really to push the project in the, in the right direction, to make it the green sustainable railway that we want it to be, to make it the more efficient railway that we want it to be. Um, and really, I think that's where the, the personal takeaway, the joy for me lies, that I know that I'm supporting this once in a lifetime project and I'm doing the right thing you know, for this particular project in terms of engineering and integration. 
Well, VJ, that's great. Thank you. And, I, and I'm sure from, from IBM's point of view, we wish you all the, all the best with what you're trying to achieve. And I'm sure Marco echoes that as well from yeah, absolutely, VJ. Wow. I, I really have an appreciation of the huge task you've got ahead of you and uh, happy to help in any way we can. Fantastic. And finally, thanks to you both. I mean, Synthesis have helped us quite a bit in terms of getting up to speed with uh, the dose management and uh, setups. And obviously, IBM tools are quite an integral part of uh, our work as well. Thank you both. You know, for people listening to our talks podcast, I think you've just will have heard an amazing insight from VJ about his world on about something that probably is getting all of our attention. Thank you for listening to our talks podcast and have a great day.